But we've talked about chronic heart failure. Now we're going to talk about the patient with acute decompensated heart failure. So let's go through a couple of cases here. It's a 62-year-old man with a prior history of myocardial infarction presenting with increasing dyspneic edema in the lower extremities. He has a CRTD device implanted two years ago. You can see his outpatient medications here. He's on everything that Paul wants him on. He's on lisinopril, carvedilol, a statin, aspirin, spironolactone, and ferrosamide. On exam, he's at a febrile, his heart rate is 62, his blood pressure is 80, his JVP is elevated with a prominent V wave, he's got crackles in both bases, a 3 over 6 holosystolic murmur in an S3, he's got 3 plus pitting edema and his legs are cool, his hemoglobin is 8, sodium is low, potassium is 4.5, BUN is 42 and creatinine is 1.9, he's 100% paced on his electrocardiogram. In initial hospital management, all the statements are true below except for one of these statements. We should reduce the carvedilol until he is hemodynamically stable. A right heart cath may inform management. Adding metolazone may improve symptoms. Low dose IV dopamine may improve renal blood flow. Or continuous IV uh, ferrosamide is preferred to bolus dosing. One of those statements is false, the rest is true. Which one is the false statement? All right. Question two. 82-year-old woman with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and multiple admissions over the past year. She's got type 2 diabetes on insulin. CKD with a creatinine of 1.8 and chronic AFib. She's also obese. She's on lisinopril, metoprolol succinate, and ferrosamide. Her blood pressure is 100. Heart rate's 88. Irregularly irregular pulse. She's uh, respirations of 18. She gets a bolus of ferrosamide and a continuous drip at 10 milligrams an hour. For the initial 48 hours, her urine output of 75 cc's per hour. Her weight did not decrease her creatinine increased. Her blood pressure is 90. She indicates that she still has dyspnea and fatigue at rest and short runs of non-sustained VT on telemetry. What is the next best step in her management? Is it milrinone, dopamine, nitroprusside, ultrafiltration, or a right heart cath? Right. Question three is an 89-year-old man with long-standing ischemic cardiomyopathy without viability or ischemia. He has chronic LV dysfunction with an EF of about 20%, admitted last night via the emergency department in the setting of medication noncompliance and dietary indiscretion. He's got a 20 to 25-pound non-volitional weight gain and pedal edema. They gave him ferrosamide 80 in the ED, yielding a two and a half liters of urine output overnight. Vitals in the morning, blood pressure 102, heart rate 88, JVP to the jaw, his lungs are clear, he's got a soft MR murmur in S3, he has shifting dullness in a fluid wave in his abdomen, his legs are warm with 3 to 4 plus edema, uh, going to the presacral and scrotal areas. Sodium of 131, NT proBNP over 3,000, and his creatinine is 2.7. What is the next step? Reinitiate outpatient metoprolol succinate, start ultrafiltration, continue IV ferrosamide, add metolazone, put them on niceratide, or do a right heart catheterization. All right. And number four, a 48-year-old man admitted with complaints of exertional dyspnea, orthopnea, PND, pedal edema, and weight gain for the past two weeks, long-standing non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, EF of 35%, with a history of hypertension and type 2 diabetes. He's on metoprolol succinate, lisinopril, and torsamide. He's of a febrile, blood pressure is 172, heart rate is 106. 
JVP is elevated, lungs are clear. It's got uh, S3 on examination, no ascites, and warm extremities with marked pitting edema to the mid-thigh. His creatinine is up to 2.3 from a baseline of 1.1. His NT pro BMP is 2,900. What is the most likely etiology of the acute renal failure? Is it one, the ACE inhibitor treatment? Two, venous congestion. Three, left ventricular dysfunction. Four, low cardiac output. Or five, hypertension. In case number five is a 78-year-old woman admitted with recurrent heart failure in the setting of a known ischemic cardiopathy. She is hypoxic on admission, satting 88% on room air, blood pressure 92, heart rate 100, sodium 130, creatinine 2.1. In addition to her systolic blood pressure, what is the most important predictor of hospital mortality in this patient? Is it her heart rate, her sodium, her hemoglobin, her creatinine, or her hypoxia? Strong votes for sodium. All right, Dr. Ada Bayfar is one of our cardiac intensive care specialists and a hemodynamics uh, expert. Uh, also uh, works in regenerative uh, cardiac uh, uh, clinics. He's gonna talk to us about the medical management and evaluation of patients with acute decomposant heart failure. Ada, thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, pleasure to be with everyone here and also virtually. So today we're going to go over what happens when um, Dr. McKee, despite his best efforts, still can't keep the individual out of the hospital and they present in uh, decompensated heart failure. So just some disclosures here. So two learning objectives. First of all, um, recognition of acute decompensated heart failure. I think this is a very key feature of its management is early and rapid intervention um, with these individuals. And then second, uh, the guidelines to really select the appropriate medical therapies uh, to intervene uh, in the setting of acute decompensated heart failure. So let's first go over how do you recognize these individuals. The way I think about it is um, really with the three Fs. So this occurs frequently in the heart failure population, right? It's one of the most common um, medical discharge diagnoses in the Medicare population um, and often leads to at least five days of stay in the hospital when patients present with this. It's fatal. Um, so typically, uh, depending on uh, the different studies that we look at, you have a potential 1 in 20 risk of mortality in the acute setting uh, with even higher rates at 30 days and at one year. And it's formidable. In other words, despite our best efforts to not only manage this acutely, uh, but also in the outpatient setting, these patients return to the hospital very frequently, one in four after 60 days, one in two after six months. That's a very difficult disease to manage, and this is why. So when you first have your diagnosis of heart failure and we intervene by starting the cardiac-specific beta blockade, the ACE inhibition or ARB, we can actually get you to a relatively stable clinical setting for a long period of time. But then triggering events result in a cascade of deterioration, and these individuals repeatedly end up coming to the hospital. Um, and if appropriate, we can intervene ultimately either by offering them transplant if they're young enough and fit enough, or in certain populations, we now have the opportunity to offer durable mechanical circulatory support devices like LVAD. And Dr. Dunley will review LVAD-based therapy in a little while. So when a patient comes to the ER, what do we look for? Uh, what is our criteria to actually bring him into the hospital 
versus let's say giving him a IV uh, diuretic in the ER and then sending him home. Well, one is tachycardia. Tachycardia is a great sign that the heart isn't able to keep up with the metabolic needs of the body. The other is hypotension. So when you see hypotension, it means that there isn't adequate cardiac output, right? That the heart, despite beating fast and doing its best, isn't able to generate enough force uh, to perfuse the body and to perfuse enough stroke volume to create blood pressure. Then you have symptomatic signs. So you have tachypnea and hypoxia, the patient's complaining of these. You may have altered mentation. You may have other features of cardiogenic shock, like cold extremities, um, persistent dyspnea, edema and weight gain. And of course, if you see worsening kidney function, that's a big uh, worrisome feature of end organ perfusion distress in this population. The causes are actually primarily due to non-compliance, um, but heart failure therapy is very hard to be compliant with, right? These patients are often very thirsty. Sometimes they do get dizzy with these medications. And so they have difficulty continually taking these. So non-compliance is the biggest problem. Ischemia, inadequate therapy, so our failure you know, in trying to send them out with the right therapy, or other idiopathic uh, features are also uh, problematic. Um, in tandem with these more common uh, medical uh, issues that are noted, there are also other ones that we should be keeping in mind, and these may come up on the boards. So you should always think about thyroid abnormalities. That can be um, a, a very common feature. Sometimes if they have a viral prodrome, you should think about uh, the fact that this infection may have triggered a cardiomyopathy. And then other things like cardiotoxins, um, use of alcohol, uh, methamphetamines or cocaines, or even patients, if they have a uh, cancer history, uh, may present with acute decompensated heart failure. The complete list is there of everything you may want to consider. First thing we really focus on is evidence for volume overload, right? And how do we do that? Well, we look for... Um, whether you know, the venous system looks congested. Easiest way to know that is by looking at the JVP. Now, in some populations, the neck is very difficult to uh, ascertain in terms of whether there is venous congestion. In those cases, I often actually use the hand veins, and you can lift them up to where the angle of the jaw is, and if the hand veins still remain bulging, it gives you the same information as a JVP. Chest x-rays can be a very valuable tool. Uh, curly B signs um, seen on a chest x-ray or other evidence of pulmonary venous congestion. On exam, S3s and rails are very important. And then what the patient tells you. They may tell you that they've had pitting edema. You can obviously see that on exam. Weight gain, hepatomegaly, and then uh, complaints of... Uh, uh, dyspnea on exertion or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or orthopnea are key features. Keep in mind clinically that edema, BMP levels, pulmonary rails may just not guide you in the right direction. What are very reliable signs of decompensated heart failure are JVP elevation or evidence of volume overload, weight gain, or complaints of PMD and orthopnea. So if you see those and you don't see the others, still contemplate uh, decompensated heart failure. As I mentioned earlier, evidence of uh, diminishment in end organ perfusion is readily available to us through creatinine and BUN. And so if we have low blood pressure paired with diminishment of renal function, those are big triggers for increase in mortality risk. As you can see in these trials, for example, they adhere, we go from a 2% mortality risk to a 21% mortality risk. These individuals 
are at huge risk for poor outcomes. With these types of findings, um, you know, opt time, get with the guidelines trials, um, when you see these, when you see a lack of end organ perfusion, you really need to more rapidly think about advanced therapies. And often, depending on the patient, you also need to start the conversation about palliative care in this population. So rapid intervention and education towards what could be the destination of uh, their disease is extremely important. All right, now that we've recognized these populations and recognized that they're at risk, what can we do to intervene to get them out of the woods? So main goals of treatment, so when I see these patients, A, I want to reduce their congestion, right? B, I want them, while they're in the hospital, to be able to tolerate activity. C, I want to set up a scenario in which these patients don't come back to the hospital. And lastly, and as a transplant doc, this is my primary focus, I want to make them live longer, right? I want to extend their survival. So the way I think about this population and what I want to do with uh, their therapy is really uh, summarized in a PV loop. I think when you think about heart failure, it's really easy to use PV loops. And I know that Dr. Geske has gone over this and Dr. Nishimura has gone over this with you guys. PV loops are a very easy way to solidify the understanding of uh, how heart failure works and how interventions can improve. So if this is a normal stroke volume, and this is a patient that has normal uh, cardiac function in terms of PV loop, what we think about are these four boxes uh, when they present with acute decompensated heart failure. So one of the first things that happens is that you expand your preload, right? Your heart dilates to be able to enhance your stroke volume. Why? Because your Emax or your product of contractility has suddenly dropped, right? So you're, if your contractility is low, your ability for a given afterload to eject blood goes down. And so you have to push yourself in the Starling curve, increase your preload to be able to have that same stroke volume. So that's that orange dotted line is where heart failure patients now live. So if you see that they're congested, it means that they have pushed themselves to the end of the Starling curve, right? They can't dilate anymore. And so what you have to do is you have to diurese them, right? Because they're congested, but you need to give them room for their sh stroke volume. So the best way to do that is to vasodilate or drop their afterload. And by dropping their afterload, you get a huge bang for your buck in low contractile states, and you can afford to get them out of the woods with regards to fluid overload. Now, what if they're wet and cold? So if they're not perfusing and they are um, also wet, now you know that their contractile force is inadequate to perfuse their end organs. And so typically for these patients, not only do we want to diurese, not only do we want to vasodilate, but we now also have to enhance their contractility. And so for this population, we often employ an inotrope and have them go to the ICU for a period of time to be able to uh, get better. Now, if they're cold and they're dry, so in other words, we have optimized their volume management, but their contractile force is so low that they still can't uh, perfuse their tissues, really what we have left are inotropes and temporary mechanical support devices, and we'll go through um, how to deploy those. If they're warm and they're dry, it's likely not acute decompensated heart failure. This isn't cardiogenic shock, it's something else, and so you should consider other things in, in those uh, populations. 
So a little bit on diuretics. I and mean, this is a mainstay of heart failure management. They do have some deleterious effects. I think um, you all know to watch out for electrolyte disturbances, in particular diminishment of potassium and magnesium. Remember that you lose magnesium with diuresis, and the loss of magnesium results in arrhythmia. So always check magnesium as well. Um, they do diminish cardiac output. Why? Because you're dropping the preload. And so you do have to um, employ other measures that counteract neurohormonal activation. Otherwise, you're fighting against yourself with diuretics alone. In someone who's presenting for the first time with this and their diuretics naive, typically we use low doses of Lasix, so Lasix, uh, 20 to 40 milligrams IV. Torsamide is used at about half the dose of uh, Lasix. And Bumex is used at about 1 20th of the dose of uh, Lasix. Um, you can think about torsamide primarily in a low albumin state. Same with uh, bumetanide. Uh, these are very well absorbed and they're highly bioavailable. Lasix is really dependent on albumin. Um, and so if you have someone who's malnourished, really um, these other two drugs tend to be much better uh, for man acute management of the syndrome. We do continually increase and titrate the dose of diuresis to find when the optimal uh, dose is for these patients. And of course, if patients are presenting with acute renal failure on top of their heart failure, we may need um, significant doses to trigger diuresis. Now, in people who have chronic exposure, uh, what you should typically do is um, is increase it by two to threefold. So if someone is uh, on a home dose of uh, Lasix at 40 milligrams, we typically give them an IV bolus of 40 to 100 milligrams. Remember that IV Lasix is twice as potent as uh, oral Lasix, right? So if you're giving uh, 20 milligrams IV, it equals 40 milligrams PO. Uh, 20 milligrams of torsamide, as I mentioned before, equals uh, 40 milligrams. Uh, and uh, one milligram of bumetanide is between 20 and 40 milligrams equivalent. Diuretics should, acute decompensate heart failure should be recognized in the emergency room, and the first dose should be given in the emergency room, right? There's no difference between bolus and continuous dosing. Every 12-hour dosing, all the studies have shown, are essentially equivalent to continuous infusion. The way I use continuous infusion is really if I don't know what the optimal dose for the patient is, and I want to uh, hour by hour measure their urine output and continually adjust. But if you have a target dose using a uh, 12 hourly bolus uh, makes no difference. Remember that your goal, goal urine output should be somewhere between three and a half liters per day uh, for these individuals. All right, so what happens when it doesn't work? What happens when we give diuretics and they don't respond? Well, we continue to increase it until we are achieving that goal dose. If we're still not achieving that, we can add a potentiating diuretic. So if you block not only the loop of Henle, but also have drugs that target the distal tubule, like the thiazides, we do get a high potentiating effect. Our drug of choice in the hospital is metolazone, but in certain instances, uh, these other drugs can also be used. The other thing to watch out for in this population is polydipsia. These individuals will sneak water. Why? Because they're chronically thirsty and they're desperate to drink water. So measures to moisten the mouth and to keep them comfortable is extremely important 
as we're aggressively trying to diuresis this population. Because if they're drinking four liters, and you're diuresing four liters, you're just going to spin your tires. Ultimately, if you're not getting anywhere, you do need to think about right heart catheterization because sometimes these patients fool you. And so if you're not getting any additional urine output, you need to understand what their cardiac index is. You need to understand what their filling pressures actually are. And sometimes uh, when we think they're volume overloaded, they end up being intravascularly quite dry. If you do a right heart cath and you prove that they do still have volume overload and you can't get the kidneys to put out uh, the urine that you need to get these patients out of the woods, ultrafiltration or hemodialysis is often utilized in this population in the ICU setting. We can use continuous dialysis if the cardiac output is low and the patient's intolerant of intermittent or if they're more stable, intermittent hemodialysis and ultrafiltration works fine. Vasodilators are utilized. And again, when we think about the force tension curve or our PV loops, remember that reducing afterload dramatically enhances stroke volume in this population. So acute usage of measures that reduce afterload are, um, are very important. And we do want to try and keep these individuals uh, at SVRIs to a very normalized level so that we continue to have excellent cardiac output as we try to diurese them. So nitrates can be used. Nitroprusides can be used. Um, Nisiretide is used more in the uh, hospital wards, not so much in the uh, ICU. And more recently, um, calcium channel, IV calcium channel blockade has also been employed in this population to achieve vasodilatation. And then inotrope therapy. So when we think about these individuals as being cold, right? So when they are changing their renal function, and they're cold and they can't perfuse their tissues any longer, we need to think about employment of inotrope-based therapies. Um, these therapies give us time to contemplate what we can offer these patients to really have a much better longevity and much better outcomes long term. Um, so we do use this therapy as a bridge to decision or a bridge to replacement therapy such as LVADs and transplants. They're not really a great option for patients with preserved ejection fraction. Um, we definitely need monitoring uh, for use of this until they've you know, really proven themselves stable for a long period of time on a stable dose. Typically, these are contemplated for the short term and it's in those people that continue to be in persistent shock despite diuresis, despite vasodilatation. And then in the long term, we contemplate this for palliation, if really there's nothing else we can offer these patients. And on top of that, we do use this often as a bridge to transplant or as a rehabilitating bridge to LVAD-based therapy. When we look at inotrope therapy, uh, one of the main ones that we use in the uh, cardiac ICU is dobutamine. It's an excellent beta-1 agonist. It increases your stroke volume, increases your cardiac output, and really has um, just minimal impact on vascular resistance and LV filling. So it's really a pure inotropic agent. Um, you can get some myocarditis with use of this chronically, but in the setting of acute management, we have, you know, mostly arrhythmias are the biggest problem. Milrinone, which I think is becoming really a workhorse inotrope therapy, is, um, is utilized quite often. It's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, which means that it promotes intracellular uh, calcium-mediated calcium release. 
uh, to achieve its inotropy. And in the same light, it can act as a vasodilator in smooth muscles by, uh, by doing the same function. Dopamine, um, low-dose dopamine, remember it acts on the delta receptors and so it can augment renal perfusion. Um, limited data is really available to suggest that this is a long-term uh, solution. We do use dopamine, however, more for its uh, beta and alpha effects uh, clinically in the ICU setting. So when we think about um, all the inotropes, I think it's very important, especially for the boards, but also for your practice, to know what all of these inotropes do. Norepinephrine is not a good choice for cardiogenic shock, right? It's an alpha agonist primarily, although it does have some beta effects. It dramatically increases your systemic vascular resistance. Should not be used in this population. Epinephrine, uh, although it has alpha effect, it also has excellent beta-1 effect, and we do use this clinically. Uh, isoproterenol, primarily reserved for the post-transplant setting, really has pure beta-1 and 2 effect. Dobutamine is very similar to isoproterenol with its massive beta-1 effect. Milrinone, as I mentioned, is an inhibitor of phosphodiesterase, and so it... Um, changes uh, your cyclic AMP levels intracellularly, um, augmenting them and letting them uh, enhance your calcium-mediated calcium release. So use of inotropes, class one indication in cardiogenic shock. If you have cardiogenic shock, if your cardiac index is below 2.2, class one indication. It's a bridge to transplant. It's a class 2A indicated intervention. For um, stage D patients with no other therapeutic options, class 2B as a palliative therapy. It's also a uh, class 2B for patients with end organ perfusion diminishment and those who have hypotension. And we typically use this indication to bridge patients to durable mechanical circulatory support devices like LVADs. And then remember that low-dose dopamine can improve diuresis, and so it's considered a 2B indication. And often, um, dopamine is now, um, is now seen as a... Um, uh, is now seen as a drug that can actually be used safely on the floors. And so even on the heart failure wards, we do use low-dose dopamine to try and enhance uh, diuresis. Uh, the reason this is so important is that if you're not in cardiogenic shock, one of the main reasons why your creatinine climbs up, in other words, if you don't have cardiac, low cardiac index, one of the main reasons your creatinine creeps up is that your venous congestion is blocking adequate renal perfusion, right? So I call it the renal afterload. Like you have this high venous congestion on the kidneys, and that actually drives the creatinine up. As you diurese these patients, creatinine comes back down. And if we're not getting adequate urine output, dopamine there is an excellent uh, measure to improve. So on top of all of the interventions that we can do acutely, uh, one of the things that always comes up is, well, what do we do with these patients' drugs, right? So Dr. McKee has perfectly titrated these patients. They've been on these medications for a while. Now they come in decompensated. Do we really want to mess up what Dr. McKee has done? Of course not, right? So um, often, unless you have... Uh, hypotension or acute kidney injury, you continue the ACE and ARB intervention, right? You do not change those medications. For beta blockers, and this is a big question that always comes up, if they have acute decompensated heart failure, but they're on the floor, they're diuresing, they're otherwise stable, we keep it going. If they are cool 
and aren't perfusing their tissues well, and we're worried about a low cardiac index, we drop them to 50%. And then if really we're sending them to the ICU uh, to start inotropes, now we're fighting against ourselves, right? So we have to hold the beta blockers in order to uh, add inotropes, um, and we can't really do one or the other. So we typically hold the inotropes until the patient's uh, recovered, and then we slowly uptitrate it in the appropriate setting. Remember that if the patient can't tolerate beta blockade, and you discharge them off of beta blockade, it's a huge risk factor for death and or recurrent uh, acute decompensated heart failure. I mentioned right heart catheterization before. It is a 2A indication when you're spinning your tires, right? So if you intervene, you diurese, you vasodilate, and you see no improvement in the patient's functions, no drop in weight, volume status isn't changing, they continue to have hypotension, renal function isn't improving, you need to look at what you're doing invasively. And so that's when we take them to what we call the table of truth or do a right heart cast so that we can get filling pressures, wedge pressures, and cardiac output slash index assessment. This is also extremely important when we're initiating inotropes, right? Because we need to know how to titrate them or when we're contemplating advanced therapies like LVAD and heart transplant. I alluded to this a little earlier, but in cardiorenal syndrome, um, really the best way to measure this is with GFR and not necessarily creatinine, and there are several surrogates to ascertain GFR. Remember that individuals who are older, who are diabetic, or who have pre-existing CKD often have the diminishment of this and cardiorenal syndrome. And we see this in about one in three, one in four acute decompensated heart failure patients. So what causes it? Vascular congestion is one of the biggest causes of this, right? Second is if you have diuresis and aggressive diuresis, you can impose a diminishment in GFR. And lastly, it's a drop in your systolic blood pressure. But if you do not have low systolic blood pressure and you see elevation in your creatinine and in your BUN, it's because of your venous congestion, right? And diuresis should reduce those. If it doesn't, you may need to contemplate right heart cath to understand what's going on. All right, so in refractory heart failure, um, you may need to really contemplate uh, renal replacement. Um, you may need to think about, you know, if, if they're not tolerating uh, the ARBs or the ACEs, um, and really now you're thinking about dialysis for these individuals, um, and they really are showing signs of end organ perfusion diminishment, and really there's nothing else to do, uh, and they're young enough and they're fit enough otherwise, we have to think about advanced therapies. And so referring to a heart failure center, transplant LVAD center, is extremely important. I would advise you as care providers to start conversations early about what these patients can accept, expect. End of life discussions are very appropriate in these settings. Uh, understanding their goals and objectives, goals of treatments, uh, advanced directives are extremely important because those initial conversations as you refer to uh, uh, transplanting centers becomes very, very uh, critical. A few things on uh, what we do for these patients when they are sort of in that last stage of heart failure. One of the things that we've developed uh, at Mayo Clinic is actually approaches to support these patients while they're still ambulatory, while they wait for heart transplant and LVAD. So one of the measures we often now use is something called 
a percutaneous uh, axillary and triuretic balloon pump where through the arm uh, we can place these devices and not allow the patient to rehabilitate, ambulate, bicycle in the ICU as they wait. This has a dramatic impact on ICU stays post-transplant. For more severe cardiogenic shock, really when the heart isn't performing at all, we can use uh, temporary mechanical support devices, um, which can be either offered in the form of Impella uh, that can be placed um, in a hybrid procedure um, between surgery and us in the cath lab. Or most recently, we've uh, at Mayo developed a ambulatory ECMO device where these patients can actually be supported fully um, uh, with an ambulatory uh, heart-lung bypass device, uh, which removes all of their venous blood, all of their left atrial blood, and oxygenates it and circulates it back in. So lastly, um, I think it's really important to remember risk of recurrence in this population. Uh, about a quarter of these patients will be readmitted to the hospital. Um, primarily, this is due to uh, noncompliance and a lack of education in this population uh, that leads to um, readmission. We have to educate them on drugs to avoid and on uh, compliance with their medication. So in summary, I think uh, it's important to remember that this is a very deadly disease and that early intervention and identification is extremely important. Uh, diuresis and va vasodilatation on the wards are the key aspects to congestive heart failure. And with evidence for poor perfusion, which is low blood pressure and poor end organ function, you need to contemplate inotropes. Thanks very much. Fantastic, Ada. Thank you very much. So let's see how much you improved the, the questions and answers. Yeah. They're doing pretty good. <laughs> so a 62-year-old man with a prior history of MI presents with increasing dyspnea and edema in the lower extremities. He has a CRTD implanted two years ago. He's on lisinopril, carvedilol, simvastatin, aspirin, spironolactone, and ferrosamide. On exam, he's afebrile, heart rate 62, blood pressure 80, JVP elevated with a prominent V wave crackles in the bases, three over six holosystolic murmur in an S3, three plus pitting edema, and he's cool to the touch. Hemoglobin is eight, sodium 127, potassium four and a half, BUN 42 and creatinine 1.9. He is 100% AV paste. In terms of his initial hospital management, which of, the follow, which of the following statements is false? So all of these are true except for one of them. We should reduce the carvedilol until he's hemodynamically stable. Right heart cath may inform management. Adding metolazone may improve symptoms. Low dose dopamine may improve renal blood flow or continuous infusion of IV ferrosamide is preferred to bolus dosing. Which of those is the false statement? They did pretty well on this one the first time around. 92% got this right. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. No, but it, it was improvement, so 40% improvement. Now, that said, I mean, the, even though we, we've got the data that shows there's no benefit, we often do use continuous infusion. Yeah. Um, and again, just reiterate what, why we would do that. So bolus dosing is often used when we know what dose to use. Um, okay. But if uh, really you're trying to still optimize dosing and you really haven't achieved adequate urine output, you may choose to use continuous infusion, so hour by hour, you can up titrate or down titrate the dose of uh, furosemide to get adequate urine output. I think that's really where we make the decision. Got it. Perfect. Case two is an 81-year-old female, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and multiple admissions over the past year. She's got type 2 diabetes on insulin, CKD with a creatinine of 1.8 chronic AFib and obesity. She's on lisinopril, ferrosamide, and metoprolol. Her blood pressure is 100. Her heart rate's 88 in AFib. Respirations of 18. She was given 100 milligram bolus and continuous infusion at 10 milligrams an hour of ferrosamide. She put out 75 cc's an hour for the first 48 hours, but her weight did not decrease. Her creatinine increased to 2.5. 
Her blood pressure is 90. She indicates that dyspnea and fatigue are still present at rest, and she has short runs of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia on the monitor. What is the next best step in her management? Milrinone, dopamine, nitroprusside, ultrafiltration, or right heart cath? So 76% I want you to put in a PA catheter. Yeah, so I think, um, I, I think obviously one can contemplate use of uh, inotropes here, but really, as I mentioned, if you feel like you're spinning your tires and you've intervened and you're not making progress and the patient looks like they're either staying stagnant or deteriorating, the first thing to do is to take them to the table of truth and do a right heart cath. Understand what the uh, pathophysiology of their disease is and then choose you know, the next best step, which would then be milrinone or do dopamine intervention if their cardiac index is low. Yeah, I, I, I think knowing what you're doing is usually a good, a good strategy and, and rather than particularly someone like this who is in such severe stress. But you know, one of the things this question brings up is the vexing problem of I's and O's not matching the daily weights. And, and how do you deal with that <laughs> practically when you're in rounds? So um, what we found is that, you know, obviously emphasis on accurate I's and O's, both to nursing staff and patients, is exceedingly important. Um, we've had patients where we've diuresed them eight liters one day and their weight still went up, right? Mm -hmm. So... They have to be drinking. <laughs> um, and so, you know, having frank conversations about, you know, patients want to get out of the hospital and just, I think, constant education or just knowing your patients yep. really does help there. Yep. Got it. 89-year-old man with long-standing ischemic cardiomyopathy without viability. He's got chronic LV dysfunction with an EF of 20. He was admitted last night in the setting of medication noncompliance and dietary indiscretion, 20 to 25 pound weight gain. He was given a uh, furosemide bolus of 80, yielding two and a half liters of urine overnight. On rounds in the morning, his blood pressure is 102, heart rate's 88, his JVP is massively elevated, but his lungs are clear. He's got an S3 and an MR murmur. He does have ascites. He's got three to four plus pitting edema uh, to the presacral and scrotal areas. His sodium is 131. His NT pro BMP is 3200. Creatinine 2.7. What is the next best step for him? Reinitiate his outpatient metoprolol. Start him on ultrafiltration. Continue IV furosemide. Add metolazone. Add niceratide, or do a right heart cath. All right, 77% chose continue the IV furosemide, which is the answer you indicated you wanted to see, and that's an improvement over the pretest. So want to talk about any other ones? Yes, yeah, so I, I mean, I think in this situation, if we're trying to achieve three to five liters a year in output and that initial intervention already got us two and a half liters, the patient isn't decompensating, they're sort of progressing, we would first continue IV uh, Lasix, and see uh, where that gets us before we start adding uh, additional agents in here. So I think metolazone, which is the other uh, choice here, would be a great potentiating drug and can be utilized, but only if we're failing with Lasix. So I think you know, the first choice would be Lasix. We keep going with that and add that later. And say, in, so they got the two and a half liters out overnight, and say the creatinine went from 2.7 to 3. Is that going to change your response here at all? Um, I think what we would do is give them a day um, just to see where things go. We typically don't react that much to creatinine. I think you have to remember that uh, creatinine and GFR aren't uh, completely linked. The other thing that I often do is look at the BUN levels. 
typically BUM foreshadows creatinine. And so if you see the BUN's gone from 64 to 52, and the creatinine's gone up, I typically anticipate creatinine will follow the next mm -hmm. day. Okay. All right, case number four is a 48-year-old man uh, with acutely admitted with complaints of dyspnea, orthopnea, PND, pedal edema, and weight gain for the past two weeks. He does have long-standing non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with an EF of 35% with hypertension and type 2 diabetes. He's on metoprolol, lisinopril, and torsamide. He's afebrile, hypertensive, tachycardic. JVP is elevated. His lungs are clear. His heart is regular, but with an S3. No ascites. He has warm legs with pitting edema to the mid-thigh. His creatinine is double its baseline, up to 2.3. His NT pro BMP is 2,900. What is the most likely etiology of the acute renal failure? Is it the ACE inhibitor, venous congestion, LV dysfunction, low cardiac output, or hypertension? Venous congestion takes the day. So I think um, we, we mentioned this a few times in the lecture. Low cardiac output can certainly impact renal perfusion, but you can't have hypertension like the way this patient does and have low cardiac output. So if you see normal mm -hmm. pressures and high creatinine, you really need to think about what I call the renal afterload as venous congestion mm -hmm. as being the main driver of diminishment in GFR. Yeah, good point. All right, and the last case is a 78-year-old woman admitted with recurrent heart failure in the setting of known ischemic cardiomyopathy. She is mildly hypoxic. Her SAD is 88% on room air. Her blood pressure is 92. Her heart rate is 100. Her sodium is 130, and her creatinine is 2.1. Which of these things uh, is the best predictor of hospital mortality for this patient? Her heart rate, her sodium, her hemoglobin, her creatinine, or her hypoxia? All right, so you were looking for serum creatinine here, but the majority said sodium. So um, again, remember that um, we look for end organ perfusion and signs of, uh, of diminishment in cardiac output and diminishment in stroke volume. And so the best surrogate for that beyond blood pressure is serum creatinine because it's a reflection of how the heart is truly perfusing other organs. So when, you, when you're looking at patients, that's really the key thing to look for. Um, if you're worried about cardiogenic shock. Yeah, this, and the sodium, um, maybe, maybe that's more in the chronic? Yeah, so sodium can be a reflection of your medication effect. It uh, could be a reflection of your volume status. Some people just have chronic low sodium levels. So it's a pretty nonspecific uh, finding. Uh, obviously, it can reflect a high volume status, but um, really doesn't give us insight into uh, mortality. Got it. 